In Season 3 of Wild Cards, we picked back up with the posse a couple of months after the destruction of Coldwater Creek. They had splintered, and been pursuing their own separate agendas in Denver, the Queen City of the West. But one cold winter night, they found themselves aboard a private train belonging to Adrian Meeker, aka the Bear, a lieutenant of the Baron that James Bogue had dedicated his life to taking down. They were each on the train for different reasons, and unaware that the others were also aboard. But brought together again by a common foe, they wound up battling and defeating the bear on top of the train, just before it was blown up by a mysterious masked figure with a jetpack. On the bear's body, they found a private Bayou Vermilion telegram detailing an upcoming meeting the next month with the Wraith, another of the Baron's lieutenants. But it only cryptically noted, the usual time and place. They made their way back to Denver, still determined to pursue their individual business. James dealt with a young girl named Claire Walker, who claimed to be his daughter, but ended up being just a skilled young con artist. Rosaline spotted, and was spotted by, Carlton Harris, the mining magnate from Coldwater Creek, and his despicable sidekick, Zachary Driscoll. A woman named Idella Beals was caught following Howell and Gabriel around town, but claimed to have simply mistaken them for someone else. Just when it seemed the posse would remain separated, Howell heard a rumor involving women dressed all in white, warning people away from an area of the plains downriver of Denver, and convinced the posse to come with him and see if there was any connection to his missing wife, Ludie. After hiring an industrious young entrepreneur named Adelaide S. Knickerbottoms to boat them down the river, the posse found more than they bargained for. Chased by a swarm of terrifyingly invasive prairie ticks, they ended up imprisoned in the home of the Sisters of Imminence, a group of gifted women working to hold back the growing darkness by whatever means necessary. And lo and behold, Ludi was there. At long last, Howell had found his missing wife, but she wanted nothing to do with him. With Gabriel sequestered elsewhere in this house of secrets, working with the enigmatic Sister Mary to unlock the potential of his new blessed abilities, the posse was at their wit's end. But an encounter with the shadowy spirits that stalked the Sisters of Eminence was enough to extract the truth from Ludi. She had seen a vision of the future in which her daughter with Howell brought ruin to the world, and so they had to remain apart until this darkness was defeated. The rift that had been developing between Rosaline and Gabriel continued to grow, made worse by their ordeal with the Sisters. Back in Denver, a strange raven began appearing outside of Rosaline's window while she slept, seemingly causing her to have horrible nightmares. And James wasn't faring much better, growing agitated at the delay in his mission of vengeance caused by their detainment with the sisters. Stretched thin already, Rosaline and James visited the Bayou Vermilion office in Denver, and when the sole employee there threatened to cause trouble, the pair of them murdered the man to keep him silent. But once again, the posse was brought together at a fortune teller's named Madame Marguerite, who insisted on performing a tarot reading for the group, only to have Chaos manipulate the cards to taunt them. Shaken by what she had just seen, Madame Marguerite took the posse to see the curious woman who had been following Howell, Miss Idella Beals. She in turn took the posse to see her boss, Agent Detweiler, the supposed Pinkerton who had been dogging James Bogue back in Coldwater Creek. Detweiler was much more than he had seemed to be, and after demanding answers about what had occurred back in Coldwater Creek, agreed to help James discover the time and place of the upcoming secret meeting with the Wraith, if the posse would do a favor for him and his organization. They were accompanied by Miss Beals, who was revealed to be the stranger with a jetpack who had blown up the bear's train. It seemed she had a bone to pick with the Baron as well. The posse traveled to Varney Flats, Kansas, by way of Pony Express rider Brumby Carter and his mystical horse Phantom, who seemed to be able to travel through hell itself. And this put them directly in the path of the night train. In Varney Flats, they witnessed the terror of this train themselves, watching as it disgorged a horde of blood-sucking Nosferatu, or nose ferrets, onto the sleeping townsfolk. They proved almost impossible to kill, and there were too many to take on at once, so the posse boarded the train and sought to free the captured citizens of Varney Flats. In the locomotive, they encountered the Wraith himself, who proved to be a more skilled huckster than Rosaline, and who teleported away before they could engage him. But with the help of Beals and a whole lot of luck, the posse was able to free the survivors and destroy the train along with its terrible undead passengers. 
back in Denver. Detweiler made good on his promise, telling the posse the date and time of the meeting with the Wraith at the Feathered Eel Club. He also told them that a plague of madness seemed to be following behind them, and that he wanted them out of Denver as soon as their business was completed. Rosaline paid a visit to the Explorer Society, and learned that it was a front for a group called the Twilight Legion, who seemed to know all about the Reckoning. She was told to find a man named Virgil Price somewhere in the Southwest, as he might know what to do about the growing threat of chaos. Just when things seemed finally to be going their way, the posse was thrown in jail for the murder of the Bayou Vermilion employee. Their accusers? None other than Harris and Driscoll. Even though the posse refuted their claims, it seemed that they were going to remain imprisoned and missed their shot at the Wraith. But Beals showed up once more and confessed to the crime with witnesses, no less, and the posse won their freedom, though it seemed that Beals might hang. Before they left, she made them promise that this would not be in vain and that they would take down the Wraith. With the help of Cletus Walker, the blackjack dealer who had aided them once before back in Coldwater Creek, the posse hatched a plan to take the Wraith unawares. But the Wraith, it seemed, was ready for them, and they just barely escaped an explosive demise. Their conflict with him and a giant undead abomination that he was controlling with a gleaming red stone rocked the streets of Denver, but in the end, the posse was victorious. James decided to spare the Wraith and remanded him into Detweiler's custody, but not before the Wraith had told them to seek the next lieutenant, the Surgeon, in her secret lair within the Sonoran Desert. The posse was forced to leave Denver, but many questions remain. Will James be able to find the Surgeon? And is he sure that he's ready for what he'll find? What does the Blackwood Society, the masters of the Raven responsible for Rosaline's twisted nightmares, want with her? The deadly trio of harrowed Colt Holbrook, Johnny Carrington, and their snake-whispering friend Clem continue to follow the posse at Chaos's behest. When will they choose to strike? What threat might the half-remembered popcorn woman from Howell's past pose to him? And how can the posse possibly hope to contend with Chaos, the Reckoner who walks the Earth? Why don't you saddle up with us and find out? We've still many a mile to go.